morning, church. It's wonderful to see everyone this morning. Welcome to everyone who's in house today and online. Let's go ahead and start out the service today with a hug and a handshake. Go ahead and greet everyone today. Again, good morning, church. It's wonderful to see everyone today. Um, Let's go ahead and start our worship service. Feel free to stand or sit or whatever you're comfortable with, and we're just going to worship the Lord today. Amen.
Everybody, can you hear me? You can't hear me? Okay, Barb. Uh, this is time of communion. If you're a visitor here, we practice open communion, which means uh, if you're a believer in the Lord, just uh, take the items. If you didn't pick one up as you came in, just put your hand up, and one of the ushers will, or, uh, will bring an offering, or will bring the communion thing to you. Hey, last week, um, the sermon reminded us that we have to be a little bit careful taking Old Testament and applying it to the New Testament, because sometimes it applies to different cultures. But I'm gonna, I found one that I've used before, but during COVID, I know a lot of you people didn't have a chance to hear it. Let me, it's in Isaiah chapter 49, and... Uh, the context is this, the uh, Judean area was under invasion, uh, there were troops outside, uh, there was hunger, there was famine, there was chaos in the cities. I, I, I don't know if we've ever had anything like that. <laughs> but the thing that the Jewish people inside were praying or saying was that God had forgotten them. 
where was God? Now, I know no one in this room has ever had a time when you thought maybe God wasn't with them. So I'm going to try to do a little bit of a balancing act. Jim, can you just hold the, the communion thing? Thanks. It's open, so be careful. Okay. Sorry about limping. Sorry about limping around. I'm going to get a rotary purple heart for cooking at the... <laughs> at National Night Out and leaning forward over the fire and I pulled my Achilles tendon. Okay, the people are in uh, Jerusalem and they're basically saying the Lord has forgotten us, the Lord has forgotten me. Outside is standing the Lord, outside the walls, just outside the walls of Jerusalem. And he says back to them, can a mother forget the baby at her breast? and have no compassion on the child she has born. Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. In other words, he's done something. He's carved each of your names, all of our names, in the palms of his hands. Your walls are ever before me. Now, it says in Isaiah that it's God addressing them, but when he ends chapter 49, it says, then all mankind will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Uh, I just think about that so much. Is sometimes we forget about the Lord, and then we need to realize that he put out his arms, had his hands pierced for us, for our redemption. So he wrote, he's written each of your names in his hand. So when you think maybe, maybe he's not there for you, just try to remember that. Just think of him with your name written in his palm. When we come to time, thank you. We come to a time of communion. It's also a time to remember Jesus and his sacrifice. On the night before he died, he took bread, passed it to his disciples, and he said, this is a way, he didn't say it that way, he said, this is a way for you to remember me. Take and eat. For this is my body, which will be broken for you. Then he took the cup, and he passed it around. He said, take this as a symbol of my blood, which will be shed for you. Take and drink. Then he said, do this in, in memory of me. And we do this every week for that. Um, I came across the episode of, uh, about stewardship, came across an episode of the uh, Chosen the other night. And it's the episode where the rabbis catch Jesus and his disciples pulling grain off of the wheat field to eat. And Jesus' response to them, because they were doing it on the Sabbath, they hadn't eaten for a day or so, they were all hungry and they had no money. They pulled the grain off and ate it. And uh, Jesus, the rabbi gets real mad at Jesus and denounces him and and uh, Jesus' response to him is, the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. And I know a lot of people, when you come to church, you think, why do they always talk about money? Well, we have, have to, to carry on the, the work of the Lord. And uh, giving wasn't designed necessarily for God. God doesn't need us to give money to him. But... When we give to him, and when we're able to tithe, our resources become better. Our own personal family resources become better. And those of you who've done that know what I'm talking about. And uh, so I just say to you that uh, giving to the Lord is actually a benefit to you because it'll help you uh, manage your own finances better and you'll be shocked at some of the things that happen to allow you to get through uh, the week after you've 
tithe, and it's pretty amazing, really. I think several people in here I know could testify to that. So there are several ways to give. You can uh, drop money in the basket at the back of the church with with the uh, usher. You can uh, send it in in the ways that are uh, up on the screen. Lord, I thank you for this church. This is a uh, generous church, a faithful church. Uh, we just thank you for the new visitors that you bring to us and the new people that have been coming to church. We're just so grateful for that. And we're grateful to Aaron being able to step in so well for Jason while Jason's gone. We thank you for everything about this church. Amen. Oh,
Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down. night where I was struggling back a panic attack and I just had to think back that God you just ask us to come as we are even if we're not perfect and all he asks is we just run to him in our times of need and he will be there for us always. Yeah. 
carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation. that we can have together. And I just pray for everyone here as all of us, all of our hearts need a surgeon at times, God, and you're always there for us. And I just pray for those who are just struggling right now. I mean, our world is struggling right now in many ways, God. And I would just pray that you would just pour yourself out to us and you would just 
make yourself known in our country, God, and that you would just be there for everyone, God, in your name, amen. All right, we're going to sing a little song before sermon, as Clint has a special request here, so... Now, some of, am I on? Some of you are old enough to remember that song when it came out. Um, the rest of you remember it from Shrek, right? <laughs> That's what I remember it from, right? I'm not that old. Until the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg in the 1500s, there was almost never a Bible to be used at a church gathering. I'm gonna move this back just a little bit more so I can see Steve's pretty face there on the front row. So there was almost never a Bible in church before the 1500s, that's just the way it was. Attendees, because of that, they used to recite scripture to each other. They had these stories memorized. It's called oral tradition, or they would tell the story and they'd pass it on that way. Well, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna tell you a story uh, that's going to take us into the sermon. Now, for those of you that want to take a deep dive into this and try and prove me wrong again, uh, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 11, uh, and I'm going to tell you the story, and there may be a little Clint interpretation in this as we go, um, but bear with me. It was, it was springtime, and, and this was usually the time when kings would go off to war. So King David calls his general Joab and says, take all of the army with you and go and take on the Ammonites. And Joab goes with the army, and they go out and they destroy the Ammonites. And then they laid siege to Rabbah. In the meantime, David decided he was just going to stay home. Now, one night he was up on the rooftop of the palace, and he glanced over at the nearby rooftop. And on one of those buildings was a woman taking a bath. And then his glance turned into a stare. And David calls one of his aides to him, and he says, hey, Who's that beautiful woman over there on the, that other roof? And the aide said, well, isn't that Bathsheba? That's uh, Uriah's wife. And David said to his aide, bring her to me. So Bathsheba came to the palace. It was an order from the king, right? And in the end, she and David slept together. And then she went back home. And a few weeks pass, 
And David gets a message from Bathsheba that she is pregnant. Now, what I didn't explain to you before, and is that you need to understand, is that her husband was in David's army, and he wasn't just a regular soldier either. In fact, if you read through the scriptures, Uriah is listed amongst the 30 great warriors of David's army. He was one of David's elite. Bathsheba is now pregnant, and Uriah is off at war. So David comes up with an idea. He messages Joab, the general, and says to send Uriah home for a well-deserved rest. Problem solved, right? Give him a weekend pass. So Uriah comes home and dutifully he comes home and reports to the king how things are going on the battlefront. And David talks to him and tells him, you know what, it's time, you should go home and get some rest. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept with the servants at the gate of the palace. So David calls him back and says, hey, I, uh, I don't know, I noticed you were sleeping at the gate. Why didn't you go home? And Uriah says, how can I go home when my men are out on the front risking their lives? It just wouldn't be right for me to sleep in my own bed. I could never do that to my men. <sighs> so David has to come up with another plan. He says, why don't you come to the palace for dinner tonight? And David then gets in there for dinner and he succeeds in getting Uriah really, really hammered drunk. Okay, that was his goal for the night thinking maybe that if he gets him drunk enough, Uriah will stumble home. But instead, Uriah stumbled out the gate, out the steps, and went right back and laid his mat down at the gate and slept with the servants again. Now David's got a real problem, doesn't he? A pregnant woman whose husband will not go back and sleep with her. So David gives Uriah a letter, letter to Joab, and he's supposed to take the letter back, and it says that the next time that you attack... I want you to put Uriah where the fighting will be the fiercest. I want you to have him lead the fight. And then when the fight peaks its fury and Uriah's at the forefront, I want you to pull everybody else back. And Uriah, not knowing what was in that note, handed his own death warrant over to Joab. Joab, being dutiful, obeyed the orders and they came to pass and Uriah was killed in action. Now, when Bathsheba heard the news, she mourned the death of her husband. And then after a season of mourning, she married David and moved into the palace. And the chapter that we're in in Scripture here closes by saying that the Lord was displeased with what David had done. Oh, I hate to hear that. I don't ever want that to be said after my name. The Lord was displeased with what Clint had done. It gives me shivers. But before this story took place, we know David, right? David was a warrior. He was an honorable king. But David was also a prolific songwriter. He did this a lot. And within his songwriting, he was also a prophet. I don't know if he realized it when he was writing these songs that he was actually prophesying. But he wrote, wrote one song that I'm sure that at least some of you are familiar with. It goes a little bit like this. The Lord is my shepherd. Have you heard that one? I don't need anything, he says. I've got everything that I need. There's no desire in my heart that God cannot meet. But then he says this, and this is prophetic for David, okay? He restores my soul. He rebuilds me when I'm broken, right? He, he refills me when I'm empty. He meets the deepest need of my spirit. And that prophecy is what takes us to the next place in our story this morning. A few months later, a good friend of David's named Nathan came for a visit. And as Nathan and David visited, Nathan said, we got a problem here, chief. Didn't say chief in scripture. I threw that in there. Um, you see, there are these neighbors who are having a spat right now. And one guy, well, he's pretty well off. As a matter of fact, you could, you could say he was rich. He's got a lot of cattle. A lot of sheep and goats. And right next to him is this guy who really doesn't have a lot. He's, he's poor, in fact. But he's got this one little ewe lamb. Probably because he only has that one little ewe lamb, he, he doesn't treat it like a sheep. He treats it like it's part of the family. He treats it like a pet. As a matter of fact, he treats it better than he, most people would treat their pets. He feeds it food right off his table. He lets it drink from his cup. He holds that ewe lamb when he sleeps. It is so sacred and precious to him. Now the rich guy, he, he had some company coming from out of town. 
And, and he wanted to fix a nice meal for them. And instead of taking one of the sheep from his huge flocks, he took the ewe lamb from his poor neighbor. And he killed it. And he cooked it. And he fed it to his guests. Now, as Nathan's telling the story, David's starting to get mad. Right? David's starting to get angry. And the farther the story went, the more angry David got. And finally, David burst out, I cannot believe that anyone would do something like that. That man deserves to die. David says, or I'm sorry, Nathan says, David, you are the man. I'm talking about you. See, God has blessed you extremely, abundantly, more than anyone could ever imagine. He protected you from Saul, and he gave you Saul's kingdom. He put you in power. And Nathan goes on and on listing all the different ways that God has blessed David. And then you murdered Uriah and stole his wife. Nathan says, you know what? God's noticed. He sees what's going on. And the next part of this is important because Nathan says, listen, I want you to hear this. God has already forgiven you for that. But there will be consequences. He's already forgiven you, but there will be consequences. Number one. The sword will never leave your home. In other words, other people in your family, they're going to get killed by the sword. And it happened. It happened in David's family. Number two, a family member who is, who is familiar to you is going to embarrass and humiliate you. He goes in farther and says, they're going to go into public and they're going to sleep with your wives just to humiliate you. And that's what happened when Absalom led his rebellion against David. And number three, the child Bathsheba is carrying is going to die. See, because God can forgive your sins, there are still consequences that come sometimes from those sins. And that, well, isn't that our story this morning? I hope I didn't bore you with all the story as we move on to the next part of this. How many of you are familiar with that song Aaron was singing this morning, the Leonard Cohen song, Hallelujah? Okay. You probably are, even if you didn't realize it. Uh, you probably stumbled across it. It's the B-side of another record that came out in the 1970s. And because the record company didn't think it was going to be any good, right? They, they put it on the other side of another song, a song that none of us remember, right? Then a guy named Bob Dylan, you heard of him? Bob Dylan comes along, and he loves it. And Bob Dylan starts playing it for his friends after he discovered it. And the next thing you know, over the next couple of decades, it's become one of the most covered songs in history. Like I said before, you Shrek fans had it in your movie. Isn't that amazing? The first couple of verses, we only had him do two verses because they're the most important for our story this morning. They paint the same picture of David. Verse two specifically relates to David and Bathsheba's story and the line at the end of the first verse, and this is what I want us to focus in on today, okay? The line at the end of the first verse says, the baffled king was composing hallelujah. I think this morning, we find ourselves in a baffled kingdom. We see a pattern building here, don't we? David sees Bathsheba. He sends for her. He gets her pregnant. And then, like a lot of times in our lives, one sin leads to more sins. And there's a domino effect that seems to happen. And by the end, David has the man killed. And the fruit of that sinful relationship, this child is not allowed to live. And David, the king, is baffled. Now, David deals a lot of times with his emotions by writing songs. You may have heard them. They're called psalms, right? Many of them. And the baffled king composes hallelujah. Maybe for the first time in David's life, he was absolutely baffled after the mess that he'd just created. And still, we can look throughout the psalms and see that David kept writing hallelujahs to the Lord. I wonder this morning if you can relate to that you've sinned and you've sinned some more and there was this domino effect and it seemed like your life was crumbling around you and yet you were still coming to church on Sunday morning still acting like everything was all right and with your voice you were lifting up a hallelujah David appears to be baffled for the very first time in his life and maybe we can make a case that the reason for that is that David really had always been the guy who did the right thing I mean, we've read his story, right? We know his history. Maybe he was baffled because this mess he'd gotten himself into was a new experience for him. Remember all the way back, I mean, our stories of David go back far. He fought Goliath, 
He sent this mountain of a man out in front of the entire army of Israel. And the army, the whole army is terrified. And as Goliath hurls insults, not just at the army, but at God himself. And David, filled with the confidence of the Lord in a boy's body, goes out and slays a giant. Fast forward, and the, the kingdom has grown tired of the rule of Saul. And David, who's being chased by Saul, could have killed him in a cave. Saul was chasing after him in a jealous rage. And David does the right thing because he knows at his heart he is not a murderer. God does not intend for him to be a murderer. It wasn't God's plan for his life, and David spares Saul. See, all throughout his life, David made good decisions. He did the right things. And then one night, one night, David leaves the door open just enough for the enemy to come in. And the enemy does what he does really well. The enemy kills and destroys. And sin entered into David's life, and he became a baffled king. Now, I've heard this story many, many times in my life. And what seems to be happening here through this is that even though this huge event in his life was terrible for him, it started before that night. It started before he wandered out on that roof. But before we get into what I think was his biggest mistake, I want you to see that there are some takeaways from this message that... I have heard that many of you have heard throughout the past um, of this very same story. And they're good takeaways, church. I want you to hear that this morning. But there might be a bigger, more applicable one that we're going to get to that maybe we've missed. Now, first, let's say this. For our purposes this morning, there are two audiences here. The first is the church. We're big C church, right? The American church. And audience number two is you, personally, this morning. It's you. And when we get to audience two this might get a little bit uncomfortable because it did for me. So here are the takeaways that we've always heard, that I've always heard about this story. Number one, David should have been off the war, right? He was the king and he stayed home while his troops were off fighting. If he had gone, he would never have seen Bathsheba. And although that is true, it seems there's more a beneficial way, takeaway than that, right? So he should have been doing his duty. That's takeaway number one. Number two, he should have just gone to bed at a reasonable time. Parents, right? He wouldn't have been wandering around to see Bathsheba or bathing there. See, listen, your parents have told you to go to bed on time. Look what can happen, all right? He was walking around up there. People might get murdered if you don't listen to your parents. Takeaway number two. Number three, you have to confess your sins. David tried to cover up adultery with murder. Not the best choice that he could have made, right? Those are three takeaways I've always traditionally heard um, in Sunday school. But, uh, but I think that maybe we have missed David's biggest mistake here if we focus on those and have lost the sight of the main thing. See, I think David's biggest mistake was that he started to buy into the idea that he was really something, right? I mean, he's the king, isn't he? He was important. I think David's starting to get caught up reading his own news clippings. And his desire for power crept in and he became entitled. Now, we've all seen entitled people before, right? But David became entitled to the idea that I am the king and I can do or get whatever I want. So he's on the roof and he sees a beautiful woman. And let's clarify something here too. She's not doing anything wrong, all right? She went out in the middle of the night, dark. No one's supposed to be there to see her. In the middle of the night, she was trying to cleanse herself from the privacy and then of an hour that would normally be private. And David looks over and he says, I'm the key. I don't need to go to war. My people are out there fighting for me. I'm going to enjoy my kingdom for a minute. And he sends for her. I think the biggest mistake was this. And if you hear anything I say this morning, hear this line. David wanted to enjoy the kingdom more than he wanted to honor the king. Right? David wanted to enjoy the kingdom more than he wanted to honor the king. And that's when he left the door open a crack and the deceiver slipped in and David became baffled. The baffled king composes hallelujah. I've heard that so many times and never thought about what it meant. Another word we could use here for baffled is broken though, isn't it? This broken king who messed up greatly. Can you relate to that at all? (laughs) Because it sounds like my life story. 
Have you ever chosen enjoying your own kingdom over honoring your king? Have you ever been broken? So now I would like us to look at the two audiences that we discussed earlier. Audience number one is the American church. Now, this is what the church used to be. You guys remember this. A generation or two ago, the church was the place that you went on Sunday, and everything that happened socially in town on a Sunday happened at the church, right? It was at the building. If you needed advice, you went to the pastor or you went to one of the elders from the church. If you need to help with something, your church family was the first people to pitch in and help out with it. The church had a voice in America, was the moral leader of America. From things like the civil rights movement all the way up into the 1970s, pastors and churches were at the forefront of fighting for the powerless and being the moral authority of our country. And then something happened. Here's some stats from last year that I wanna share with you. The Barna Research Group do an annual survey And then they release their findings, and they call it the state of the church. And it can be a useful tool to see what's going uh, going on around us in the church world. And here are some sobering stats from that day. Number one, people who claim to be Christians are down 15% from one year ago to 63%. And 63%, that sounds pretty good to me uh, until I see the next stat. Number two, only 47% of the 63% ever go to church. So if you go to do some quick math, that's like 30 some percent, I don't know, that actually go to church. That's down 50% over the last generation. It gets worse, so buckle in, all right? Number three, only three in 10 unchurched people have ever had someone share the gospel with them. Couldn't believe that when I heard it. Seven out of 10 people have never had anyone care enough about them to share the life-giving story of Jesus. And let me tell you something. That should break our hearts. 39% of people surveyed believe that pastors are honest. 39%. um, Now, in the year 2000, that number was 73%. And we've seen pastors and leaders fall from grace, not living out the message they preach from their large platforms. And that shadows all of us. It reflects on all of us. And I have to ask this question, what does that make Jesus look like in the world? Church, we are a baffled kingdom. Where does the country look? I mean, they don't trust our leaders, they don't trust our pastors, and people aren't hearing the gospel. They're not, none of that's happening. People aren't hearing from us anymore, so what are we doing? A really bad report came out a couple of months ago. There was an an investigation happening in the Southern Baptist Convention And about two months ago, they released this report. I want to be clear that it is not our intention to single out that group of people. Just so happens that this report was released recently. um, And it's the most recent example I have to discuss. There was an internal investigation into sexual abuse amongst the Southern Baptist churches. This report was 228 pages long and cited over 700 names of clergy and staff in the Southern Baptist churches who were guilty of some sort of sexual assault against church members. And these instances, in many cases, have been swept under the rug for so many years so that business could continue as usual. And when this report came out, there were dozens and dozens of those names that were still employed at the very same churches where the incidents happened. That really sounds to me, church, like a baffled kingdom. In the church, our sins really aren't that different from David's, are they? The church in many instances have lost sight of the main thing in pursuit of large buildings and and big numbers and people and business organizations and all the stuff that comes with the glory of American Christianity. And we've lost sight of the king. All throughout the New Testament, the church is described as the bride of Christ. And in this way, aren't we just adulterers? Aren't we the same as David and we've lost focus as we've shifted towards numbers and power and building our own kingdoms? Church, somewhere in the middle of this, we've got to find our way back to preparing the way for the king. And we can't be worried about marketing campaigns to to the people that to try and get people to come in. We have to be a church that's prepared to go outside these doors and changes that three out of 10 to a much better number. How about 10? 
All so that more and more people can know the king. So that was audience one, that's the church. Which brings us to audience two, you. That three out of 10 number, who's, who's responsible for that? Us, right? That's all of us. Some of you are gonna say, well Clint, that's your job. <laughs> If that's how you feel, I'm going to point you back to some some really interesting scripture for you. Um, This responsibility is for all of us. And it starts with you recognizing your similarities to David. Recognizing your brokenness to seeing how baffled we are. Maybe it's a small little addiction that you have that doesn't really seem to bother anyone else. And those things can lead into broken marriages and broken families then that turns to helplessness and hopelessness. Maybe you struggle at your job. You've been, in, you've been demoted or made part-time or something's happened in your work and you're at the brink of losing your employment and you never let your spouse know that there was even trouble going on and your bank account dwindles and dwindles and the numbers get lower and lower. Or maybe you've just left the door open a crack like David did and you've allowed inappropriate messages from somebody to flow in. Or maybe the door swung wide open and you post really silly things on social media. We all end up in front of God eventually broken at some point in our lives, just like David did here. So how do we fix it? I mean, how do we make that change? Well, wouldn't it be nice if we just had David's thoughts on dealing with all of this? Maybe a diary or a journal. Then I remembered, you know what? We have the Psalms, (laughs) don't we? David wrote a lot of his thoughts in there. And after digging, it appears that David wrote Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 right about this time. We're going to take a look at those two. Uh, Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin, and you did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all of the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from the trouble, from trouble, and surround me with the songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. Now I want to shift over to Psalm 51. In your Bible, if you're following along, it's probably a subnote at the top of Psalm 51. It says, For the director of music, a psalm of David. And then the interesting part. When the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Is that subtle? Okay. I think we know exactly what's happening in David's response here. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. And here's a chorus that I used to sing in high school at church camp. Create in me a pure heart, God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. 
Open my lips, Lord, and let my mouth, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God will not despise. You know what that sounds like to me? A baffled king composing a hallelujah, doesn't it? That's what David was thinking afterwards. The best line in that famous Leonard Cohen song, Hallelujah, is when he says this, with every breath I drew a hallelujah. And maybe you're wondering, how did David get from baffled king to every breath being a hallelujah? You just read his thought process there, how he worked through it. The difference is that David's response to this calamity, this this disaster he brought on himself within his culture is very different than our response many times. Yes, he hid his sin. Yes, he really, really messed up. But then he repented, and he didn't just repent, he asked God to search him. He asked God for forgiveness. He asked God very specifically to give him strength to go out to other transgressors and show them that there's a different way that they can live. And guess what, folks? David is not known as the adulterous king, is he? David is known as the man after God's own heart. Because God is really good at taking broken people and healing them And then helping other broken people through that situation, the same situation. So again, I ask you this morning, how how do we do it? I fear maybe you're not going to like the answer, but, but there are takeaways for today as well. Number one, repentance is the key to refocusing. I I don't know what sin you came in here with this morning. I don't know if you've created a real mess for yourself. I don't know your family situation. I I don't know where your mind and your heart are this morning. But we're never going to be the church that changes the perception of Jesus for the masses until you deal with you. Right here. We can't be a place where the lost are found and the broken are healed until you deal with you. And the only way that happens is through repentance. And church, that is really hard. It is really hard. It is humbling to set yourself before Almighty God and confessing your junk like David did. But it's the only way for us to go from broken to healed. Number two, brokenness can be repaired by the one who created us. Who better to repair that than the one who created you? The one who knit you together in your mother's womb. That is who will repair you. And number three, this is really important. Your brokenness, it can end today. Hear me again. Your brokenness can end today. There is absolutely no reason to wait around for it. David's circumstances didn't change. He still dealt with the consequences of his sin. And it can happen for you. And it only takes a little bit of courage and a little bit of honesty with yourself to open up to the Spirit of God and say, I'm broken, and this is why I'm broken, and God, fix me. Church, imagine if we had the mindset, that said, if we said, Lord, I am healed, now send me out and use me with other transgressors to show them that there's another way to live. Don't you think that three out of 10 number would have to change? Do you ever get tired of living for your own kingdom? I do. I'm I'm guilty. I'm tired of watching the news and thinking, where's the church? I'm tired of seeing people not know Jesus simply because we're not telling them. It can start today, friends. It starts with repentance. And then the Holy Spirit does in your life what it does. He gives you boldness. The Holy Spirit gives you strength. He gives you courage to go outside of these walls and bring other people with you. And then we become an army of broken and healed people. 
What can God do with that? I don't know what your brokenness is this morning, but I do know the healer. And I trust that today he wants to heal you right where you are, right in the middle of your mess. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I know that the only way for you to go from broken to healed is the same way that David did, the same way that Paul did, the same way that Peter did, the same way all of the heroes of our faith did, by repenting and trusting in the Lord Jesus. Your brokenness can end today. Let's pray. God, you are so much in control, we just forget, we just ignore. We like to settle in our own kingdoms and look forward to what I can accomplish. And in the middle of that, God, so much gets missed. God, I pray you're speaking into our hearts this morning as I know you have something to say for everybody in here. I don't know what shape that's gonna change. I don't know what that's gonna do differently in their lives. But David's life speaks into the heart of everyone who calls you Lord and everyone who is seeking after something that is missing in their life. He lived it all. God, we just pray we'd use his example to to really shape ourselves for what's to come. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna have an invitation song this morning. If you've never been broken, bless you, but you're probably lying. Some of you have healed. Some of you still need healing. Some of you have got stuff in your life that you just haven't been able to handle on your own. You spent years trying to figure out how you will do it. You spent years thinking, you know, between God and myself, we're going to figure this out someday. And you've never done it. You just can't quite get over it. You need to give those things up to Him and say, I can't control this. God needs to heal all those places in your heart this morning so that we can be a body of people that shapes the world around us. Not because we're perfect, but because we have our identity in the healing that God gave us. Maybe people will see us different. They'll see us as people who are flawed, but celebrating the King. That's going to draw people more than them thinking that we're setting a standard for them that they'll never achieve. They need to see our hurt. They need to see our brokenness. And they need to see that we will not let the deceiver rule over our lives in the midst of our failure, in the midst of our hurt, in all the things that that have crashed down upon us, whether it's uh, diseases or it's our economy, whatever it is, we will not allow the deceiver to have control of how we live our lives, how we shape what we do with ourselves, and how we treat other people around us. No, there's a king that's in charge and instructs me that I need to follow after the example of his son, and that's to shape, shape and love the world around me by being as much like him as I can be. And that starts with us saying, I'm not in control, God. I'm broken. Fix me. He can. The Holy Spirit will start working in your life in a way that you never imagined and a way that you're terrified of a little bit this morning. But I promise you, it'll be something that with great, great reward. If you have something that you need fixed, if you have something you need in your heart, we would be happy to pray with you this morning. If you need to give your life and your control of your life over to Jesus this morning, we want, to sh- we want to share and celebrate that with you as well. Just be honest with yourself. Let's be David in those songs. And let it all go. Would you stand with us as we sing our invitation song? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood I dare not trust the sweetest spring, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust this was but only trust me this Christ alone made me all in the Savior's love through the Darkness 
seems to hide His face. I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the hill. My anchor Good morning. I just want to share a few announcements with you this morning. This Wednesday, the 10th, our middle and high schoolers will be going to Eugene for the day. It is going to be a fun day. I'm just telling you right now, if you have any interest at all, uh, Brian and I, we're going to be taking the van up. We're going to go to the Family Fun, uh, Family fun Center. We're going to go out and eat after that. And then we're going to go to uh, the minor league baseball game up there, the Gems game. We're look is it not the Gems? What's it called? The Emeralds. The Gems is an Illinois thing. My apologies, everyone. You know, we're going to go and spend the day together. Uh, if you have a middle school or a high school, or encourage them to come out with us on Wednesday. It's going to be a great day. Today, this afternoon, though, is uh, day camp at Camp Merlewood, and that's for kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, it's not too late to go. If you want to go, you just let us know. Uh, or you parents, you can take them out there for registration at 1230, Okay. Um, we had our food drive in the back. We have a 101 pounds of food back there that was raised for our local food bank. There you go. And finally, our school supply giveaway is coming up. Barb has been in here working tirelessly back there. Um, it's going to be August 22nd, 23rd. If you'd like to donate items, there's a list of supplies at the Welcome Center that we could still use. All right. Thank you. All right, go ahead and stand as we close out our service today. So when I fight, I fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you Every fear I lay Oh, God, the battle belongs. 
every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you Oh God, the battle belongs to you Oh God, the battle belongs to you Amen, God bless you to go today